So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Genetic Engineering and Society Center's weekly colloquium seminar. Uh, today, we have Dr. Louis Rivers, the Associate Professor at the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources. And his research focuses on the examination of risk and judgment and decision-making processes in minority and mi marginalized communities with particular regards to the natural environment. It also says he's a fan of running and comic books. So I'm hoping or thinking we might have some comic illustrations in this presentation, but I don't want to give it away. <laughs> and today he is going to be talking to us about how our conceptualization of cognitive decision-making ma decision biases and heuristics influences how we engage with understanding communities regarding issues of justice. Justice. So welcome, Dr. Rivers, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to hand it over to you, and if you can start sharing your screen. Yeah, thank you. Everybody can hear me okay? All right. So um, that was my official title, Decision Heuristics and Biases. Think about that in Community Engagement and Justice. Um, disclaimer, this is a super informal talk. It's more of like a you're getting a chance to walk through my fairly cluttered mind around some issues. So, you know, I'm going to put some ideas out there and maybe we can have a discussion later. But uh, yeah, this is more of a journey through what I've been thinking about for the last couple of months. So this was the initial title I gave. And it's just like um, some ideas I've been playing with. But really, if I'm thinking about what the real title is, it's that things are really messed up. And they have been for a long time. Has my work or field of study, uh, study contributed to this sad state of affairs? You know, if I take that a step further and I'm brutally honest with myself, you know, am I an agent of oppression? So I kind of want to go through this idea in this talk and um, kind of walk you through how I got to this point in thinking about my work and my state of my field of work. So some background. Like uh, was said in the introduction, my theoretical background is definitely around these ideas of risk and risk perception and looking at judgment and decision-making from a cognitive psychology perspective. And I do this in the context of minority populations, vulnerable populations around natural environment and stuff. And increasingly my career over the last eight or nine years, 10 years has really focused a lot more on these ideas around environmental justice. So like, you know, I've taken this focus, this theoretical focus on uh, cognitive psychology and risk and decision-making, working in the natural environment in these contexts. And I've worked in a couple of different places. So like, um, not work, but I've interacted in a couple of different places. And I see patterns on them in all these places. So I've served as an advisor to the EPA on their um, board of scientific counselors um, for air and energy program. I am on the planning commission for Chapel Hill. So, you know, there I'm part of a body making decisions about development in our town and future development. And then there's work I've done in Southeast Raleigh around, you know, nuisance flooding. And the fact that this is a community that's just really been placed in harm's way for a lot of natural environmental issues. And the thing that I noticed over and over again is that we talk about equity, we talk about fairness, we talk about inclusion, and we talk about justice, but the stakeholders, especially the lay people, the community members I interact with, sometimes the employees at agencies, sometimes the employees with the town of Chapel Hill, the applicants that come before us for the planning commission, or like uh, when people come to protest the project before us, no one is satisfied. It just seems like justice is incredibly elusive. Um, it just feels like something is systemically broken. And I think I've realized this for a while and I've kind of been like this meme where like, you know, I think for most of my career, I've been in a burning room and I've just been like, this is fine. Because there's this distance that us as academics try to provide this idea of subjectivity or um, objectivity when we do our research. And I just think that increasingly that's not something that I can, um, hold on to or justify. I'm not sure, you know, I'm just beginning to think maybe this is not fine. And um, part of these ideas, I wanna give a shout out to some of my GES Center uh, colleagues. 
some of these ideas started to crystallize when I started doing work with um, Jason Delborn, Katie Barnhill Dillon, and other colleagues around the GE Chestnut. And I was really introduced to some new ideas for me, specifically ideas around reflexivity and thinking about, you know, our role in the science that we, um, that we practice. So like, it was really helpful to have this framework that helped me think through what am I doing as a scientist and how does my science interact with the populations that I work with and like the goals I'm trying to accomplish. Really a deep dive into thinking about um, my place in all this. So it really kind of started me on a journey and like, you know, this is kind of a corny picture, but it kind of started me on a journey of seriously thinking about the central question for the talk today and some like ideas related to that. And that really is like this question of like, um, am I an agent of oppression? Have I, in my conducted science in this way that I was trained to do almost 20, 25 years ago, really think about trying to be constantly objective, avoiding advocacy, have I perpetu perpetuated, you know, systems of oppression? And is my science contributing to the oppression of the populations I claim to be helping? So like, this is a question I've really been thinking about pretty seriously. And um, I really wanna focus on myself instead of like, you know, pointing the uh, point at other people and think about how I play a role in this. So that really takes me back to this earlier, you know, just a couple of minutes ago, we were talking about my background and like, you know, really think about these questions of around environmental justice. And um, what it led to me was also thinking about what part of my training or my background do I need to really seriously think about and maybe question some of the assumptions I've just taken for granted since I was a graduate student. And that really led me to like, I need to seriously examine the way we think about judgment and decision-making as cognitive psychologists and some particular systems in particular, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit in this presentation. And um, there's a lot of things that I could have focused on, but I think the best presentation is really provide a kind of narrow focus and something that people can dig into. So I really wanna think about this idea of dual processing, something that's very established in the cognitive psychology literature something that you know has made its way to uh, popular press. You see it in books all the time, you know, self-help books, stuff that um, Malcolm Gladwell has talked about, stuff that's really kind of become part of our cultural zeitgeist in general. But this dual processing is the idea that we have two types of thinking. We have this system one thinking, which is intuitive, quick and affect rich, and is filled with all types of decision shortcuts. And then we have this system two thinking, which is, um, you know, normative, it's slower, it's not intuitive, and it follows these normative decision rules, like these weighing of preferences. This is kind of like, um, it's just like the more rules-based way of thinking. And really the shortcut for this, the shorthand for this, and I think these are pretty accurate, is like system one really involves thinking and feelings. It involves emotion and feelings. So I think that's the categorization we've put on system one type thinking. That it involves people really relying on their gut reactions and their emotions. And then there's system two, which we've categorized largely as like kind of rules and logic. And I think, and the popular conception is that um, these systems kind of duel with each other. I think that's how we often think about it that um, System one is constantly being tempered by system two, or system two thinking is constantly being kind of, you know, hampered by these interference of emotions from system one. But in reality, you know, and there's a large body of literature that suggests this, these systems aren't really fighting, they're friends. They've been friends for a long time. They kind of work together. The best way for us to have successful decision processes is where we engage both system one and system two. And Further than that, you know, there's research from Lowenstein and colleagues, this risk of feelings model, which some of you may be familiar with, that emotions and feelings are throughout our entire decision-making process. It's not like we can put um, cognitive evaluations in one box or feelings in another box. These are really things that, these are systems that work together and tightly to help us make decisions. So, um, 
So you see that from the risk as feelings framework. And you also see that from the work from um, Damasio with his somatic marker hypothesis, this idea that emotions help us guide our analytical processes. So it's really difficult, if not impossible, to separate the two systems. It's like, you know, um, system one and system two thinking, they're really paired. And the research shows that we need both of these systems operating together to kind of have successful decision-making processes. However, what I've noticed in my time in the academy and um, really in this field is that we've really problematized system one thinking. We have really, um, it's, we've problematized it. We've really focused on this intuitive, quick, affect rich, and we focus on decision shortcuts. And I think I would argue there's a cottage industry in academia of creating heuristics and biases that focus on the shortcomings of system one thinking. So the affect heuristic, availability, representativeness, anchoring and adjustment. We really focused on all the shortcomings of system one thinking. And that's a problem to me. And the problem is not necessarily because of the academics who do this work, I think it's all really interesting work and really some of the most exciting experimental work I've seen in our field. But the problem is it like surrounding areas. So if we look also in other parts of different literatures, system one thinking or the idea of emotions and feelings, unfairly, those have been stereotyped onto certain members of our society. So you see work that says that women politicians are still considered too emotional to run for office. This idea of emotions are often tied to women women of color and people of color, fairly or unfairly, we have tied this idea of system one thinking in a negative pejorative way with these groups of people. Um, conversely, we've tied system two thinking, this idea of rules and logic, largely with maleness, especially with white maleness. And I'm not suggesting that researchers who study the heuristics and biases of system one are inherently thinking about, you know, um, exacerbating this um, stereotypes that we make, but they do contribute to it indirectly. So by pathologizing, you know, system one thinking, by focusing on these heuristics and affect, I think we've done a really big disservice to the advantages of system one thinking and also to the advantages of these two systems working together. So like I said earlier, you need system one and system two thinking for like kind of a successful decision process. But what we've done is consistently say and point out the flaws in system one thinking, because there are plenty of flaws in it. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's fair just to focus on those flaws. And I think it has some really detrimental effects. Because what I'm more interested in the further I go in my career is what happened when system two thinking runs amok? We're constantly focused on the problems with system one thinking, which coincidentally we associate with women and people of color, people that we problematize in our society in general. But what happens when system two thinking, which, we, which is largely associated with whiteness and maleness, what happens when it goes too far? What happens when we create systems where rules and logic are not tempered by feelings and emotion? And that's really, um, something that's kind of been a driving factor and nagging me in the back of my head when I have these experiences in places, you know, at the EPA or this planning commission or the work I do in Southeast Raleigh. So there's not much research on this. So this is me speculating to some extent, but I think we kind of know what happens when we, when system two thinking goes too far and it's not being tempered by system one thinking. I think we end up with our current society. You know, I know you're saying, Louis, that's a huge jump. And yes, it is. So like we can discuss that later. But I think what we have now is a society where we have, you know, implemented system to thinking maybe to our detriment and especially to the detriment of justice and treating people correctly. And what does that mean um, specifically? Um, I think that we have set up legal systems, corporate governance, environmental regulation, 
um, even academia in this kind of walled off garden, which are highly governed by system two type thinking, which are highly governed by rules and logic. And inadvertently, we have left out notions of values and morality and ethics and right and wrong. We've left these questions outside of this system or when these questions do come up, we make it so difficult for lay people to engage with them that we've almost turned these system one type things into system two type projects. I mean, these questions of right and wrong and values and morality and ethics, they're suffused with that throughout these systems, but they're often difficult to directly engage with. And the problem there is that when we don't have clear ways of engaging with these issues, there's, those questions are still answered. So even though we don't directly talk about what's right or what's wrong, or we don't talk about values, or we don't talk directly about morality or ethics in these systems, we still have answers for those. And the problem is that the morality, the right and wrongness, the values of people who have designed these systems have filled that vacuum. And they become bedrocks of that system. And we've never had a chance to really directly address them because we're so caught up in these ideas around rules and logic without thinking about the importance of feelings and emotions and the role that they should play in these systems. And, you know, I recognize that this is incredibly difficult. These are tough territories. Like, uh, this directly goes against our ethos of, or a lot of our ethos of uh, objectivity and avoiding subjectivity in our science. But the fact that we don't have clear conversations about these and that these conversations are not easy for people to engage in is a major problem to me. Um, and especially what I keep thinking about is like this idea of justice. We talk about environmental justice we talk about civil rights justice. You know, we've had protests over the summer around Black Lives Matters, and like justice has just become kind of a major idea that we try to engage with. And when I think about justice, I really veer towards this second definition, you know, the principle or ideal of just dealing with right action. That's not an objective thing. Justice is subjective. And I think we need space to talk about that subjectivity around justice, but that space doesn't exist in how we currently conceptualize our many of our systems. Especially, a lot of our systems, I would argue, we focus on rules and rightness, and it comes. I think it really comes out of this bias towards system two type thinking and the pathologizing of system one type thinking, and we're di and we're keeping people out of that conversation. And when we're not having a conversation about it, it's the vacuum's being filled by default by other people's morality that we never have a chance to really directly discuss. And when I talk to people in the community or when I talk to people after a planning commission meeting who are really upset with our decision because we are bound by the rules and guidelines of our committee, I, they can feel this innately. Maybe they have different language for it, but I think they realize that something is wrong with our system. And I'm not saying that our system's completely wrong because of uh, this focus on system two type thinking while avoiding the implementation of system one type thinking. I think there's all types of things that contributed to the inherently broken nature of our system. History, cultural, you know, all types of factors. But I think this is part of it and I focus on this part of it because it's the part that I'm closest to. So I think it was incumbent on me to think about how the field of study that I am closest to and I engage with has contributed to these type of systems. So like, you know, like I said, when we have public, when we have people call into our EPA meetings, you know, at the end there's public, it's open to the public. So often people are just frustrated because it seems like we're just, we forget what's right or wrong. And I think earlier in my career, I would be inclined to say that they need to have a greater technical understanding of what's going on in the subject, or that they're just lay people and these are really complex issues. And, you know, maybe this is a space for you to take up. But increasingly, I'm beginning to realize that 
you know, maybe our systems are wrong. And that really brings me to like um, thinking about my own career. And a big part of my career is trying to provide a space at the table or a voice for these minority populations or vulnerable populations and how their environment is regulated. And often, even once they have this space, the decisions that are being made are still detrimental to these populations. Um, which makes me think about this quote from Roxane Gay. That, you know, maybe not every table is worth having a seat at. And maybe the tables, I think specifically my work, the tables of environmental regulation, maybe it's not worth having a seat at this table because the table's not meant to provide justice for you or your, or your community. The table's just not designed that way. You know, and brings me back to this idea of my operating as an agent of oppression. You know, um, maybe, if I'm being blunt with myself, maybe I am, but I'm trying. <laughs> you know, in closing, that kind of brings me to these questions that I've been dealing with of like, what does it mean for me to be an honest broker? Is it really possible to be an honest broker if you're in the pursuit of justice? What does advocacy mean? I often talk to my graduate students saying that you need to avoid advocacy because you need to, the science is our end, but what if our science is flawed in itself or the way we're doing the science? Um, who do I serve? Do I serve um, science? Or am I serving these communities I'm trying to work with? What does that mean? And then, you know, what am I willing to sacrifice in order to try to help these communities that I say I'm trying to help? So these are some of the questions that have been going through my head. Um, I know this has been kind of an unconventional talk, but I just wanted to kind of go through some things I've been thinking about. And um, kind of what I want to leave you with is to encourage you to go on the same journey yourself through your own science. I think a couple of things. A, I'm perfectly fine if I realize that things I've done in the past have not been good for the society, for the communities I want to work with. I don't think that makes me a bad person or a bad scientist. I just, it means that there's room for me to grow. So often people are afraid to admit their failures because they think their failures define them. I know that's kind of self-help bookish, but I think the first step is admitting that, yeah, I'm wrong and I can do better. So like, you know, I think it's incumbent on us as scientists, and especially scientists who claim to care about ideas around justice, to really examine our motivations and the work that we're doing. And then we have to go past the broader impacts of it all, you know, NSF and broader impacts, and actually go to the intellectual merit of our science. And is the intellectual merit of our science perpetuating systems of oppression. And I think some of my science is perpetuating systems of oppression. And I need to be cognizant of that and make changes that help avoid that in the future. Hopefully I can avoid training my students into the same kind of messed up system. So um, I wanna thank you guys for providing me a space for some random ramblings around uh, my thought process. And I like to open it up to discussion I'm not saying I have any answers. I just kind of want to open up a space to think about this. And then um, if you want, I have some sources about the stuff I presented to you today, which I be I think you guys have my slides, so you can probably get a copy of this. So um, yeah, thank you guys for allowing me to come today and I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing. Thank you, Louie. I think we already have a few questions in the chat box. So I just want to remind people if they want to leave questions or thoughts in the chat box so we can look over, or also if you want to raise your hand, if you want to ask Louie a question directly. And Louie, I think the first question here, are you able to see some of these questions from Brandon McFadden? Yeah, but if people want to come on or like, if so, I think some of them are like uh, comments, I encourage, you know, like sometimes, if people want to come on and say what they want to say, like maybe they have like a preamble that leads up to your question or something, I think that's perfectly fine. Cause you know, I want to open up a space that kind of have discussion around these issues. Great, so if Brandon or Jason or Jenna, 
Um, if they also want to come on, we can let them go. And I see that Amanda also has her hand up. So I'm going to quickly start with Amanda with her hand up. And if anyone else wants to start the, the discussion. I, I can touch on Brandon's question, this idea that can you point me to a literature that claims that system thinking is based on identity? I'm sorry, that may have been confusion on my point, how I was presenting it. I'm not saying that system two thinking is based on identity. I'm, what I'm suggesting and what you see in the literature being suggested in the literature is that the traits of system two thinking have been identified with a certain identity. So it's, that's a, that's a, it's, a, it's a fine but important subtle difference. It's not so much that your identity defines how you think, it's the fact that society has stereotyped certain types of thinking with certain identities. So that's kind of a difference in what I was suggesting. So yeah, Brandon, thank you for helping me clarify that. But I think Nora had her hand up, sorry. Sure, I'll, I will unmute Nora. Okay, here we go. Uh, hey, Louie, thanks. I mean, all those great questions. I hope we can continue to have this conversation. I hope we continue to dedicate uh, moments where, uh, or colloquium where we keep going at those questions. And I would, you know, I hope people like you, I mean, what bravery, Louie, what bravery. Um, and I like that also you forefront um, that all of this is a work in process. And so, you know, a couple of weeks from now, we might have something different. And I hope we continue to have that spirit in genetic engineering and society, because it's really hard to step forward with your tentative ideas, but that's often the only way to work through ideas. Um, you made me think about audit culture. And so when I was thinking about uh, people who struggle with what you're saying, we all struggle with bureaucracies. Uh, and this was also in response to Brandon about you know, the relevance of system two thinking in our society today. Um, we need system two thinking because we live in um, large scale societies, but we all get frustrated when, we have, when we're asked to fit our complicated lives into spreadsheets and reporting forms. And I think that's like a great example of where system one and system two thinking clash. And then when I think about identity groups for whom that's basically how they have to approach the larger society, right? That larger society is basically functioning like some kind of spreadsheet or reporting form that they never exactly fit into, but are asked to kind of get squeezed into these boxes. And there are consequences on the other side if they don't do it, right? So that was all I had. Yeah, I, um, I'm not saying we need to get rid of system one thinking. I think uh, it's incredibly important, but it has to be tempered by system one thinking. Uh, by sy system two needs to be tempered by simple system one. And in increasingly, I just don't see that happening in the populations I work with. What I see is often, um, there was a board of adjustments meeting where they over, I'm sorry to get into this minutia. Anyway, there was an unpopular ruling with a lot of people in the community that was approved by this board. And uh, when the board was voting, everyone, the board member says, I realize this is a wrong decision. It's bad for the community. Nobody likes this project, but I have to vote to approve it because these are the rules. And that happens so often. And like, to me, something is fundamentally wrong where we live in a society where that is happening over and over again. I don't know, I don't know how we can argue that we have a society where we protect the most vulnerable people. We don't. Our systems do not protect the most vulnerable people. I see that over and over again. That's a morality call. I would prefer that we were just open and saying that we don't really want to protect these people. Stop paying lip service to it. But I'll stop talking. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna un I'm gonna unmute Amanda Minello. Hi, um, thanks for bringing this all up. Um, so similar to what you were just saying, I feel like I have a really hard time grasping how to move. Like rules can be really functional in some ways because they give. I feel like groups that we want to protect, they give them like firm rules to hopefully give those protections um, or opportunities. But then I feel like 
does that get away from the general culture of inclusivity and like less rules that we might want? Um, I don't know. I, maybe I'm not wording my question properly, but it's like, how do we cultivate um, a community of inclusivity with without focusing on rules? Um, I feel like leading by example is to me, seems like the most natural way to do it. You want leadership to be, you know, open to many perspectives. Um, but I feel like rules can also give us so much structure to provide certain opportunities. And that to me is just something that kind of conflicts all the time because I think rules can be way too bureaucratic and we get bogged in little things um, that kind of detract from our core message. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on that, on how to kind of you know, rules can be helpful in some aspects, but I don't know. What do we do with that conflict? Yeah, and I'll open up for other people to respond, but I think rules are incredibly important. But, and this is helping me to clarify some of my thoughts. What To me, what is also important is like, what are the values that set those rules? And like, you know, yes, if we're having rules that protect vulnerable populations or protect people, that's one thing. But if our rules really don't protect those populations or they provide advantages to the people in power, then that's a problem. And the thing is that rules hide subjectivity. I think we often think of rules as being objective and these systems as being objective, but there's subjectivity in all these systems and we never get a chance to talk about that subjectivity. We just focus on the objectivity of the rules. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and that's, I, yeah, you're definitely getting at what I'm, what I was trying to verbalize. Um, yeah, exactly. Louie, I wanted to read uh, the next message from Jason that he says, thank you for such a provocative and personal presentation. I'm interested in what it means to place Trump into system two thinking when he seems to operate so much in system one. And that seems to be some of his appeal to ignoring the logics of science, traditional authority, political norms, and creating enthusiasm in his base on issues of justice from their perspective. So does Trumpian momentum represent a failure of checks by system two or system one? I think, yeah, that's a great question, Jason. I guess a couple of things I put on there because um, I have found it ironic when he was running against Clinton and we, there were concerns that she would be too emotional. It's turned out that he's been much more emotional. But I think it also, to me, he's emblematic of what's kind of what's happening. He is, uh, he's created a system where ostensibly he largely benefits from these rules, these system two type thinking. But it's so clear that he's driven by system one. But he's so protected by system two. He's so, I think it's easy for him to say, I'm going to rule law and order and all these things, but it's clearly all system one type thinking. And there's, we don't challenge in him. We don't, no one, I feel like you don't hear about he's too emotional, he's too much id. You hear from us, but his base doesn't see it that way. So I think, you know, I think the the paradox of Trump is something that to me is important to see. Cause I think so often, and, is, it, and it, that's the vacuum I'm talking about. We have these systems, rules, and logic, but they benefit someone. And his morality is clearly being served by our current system of rules and laws. But it, it, it's interesting too, Louis, that that a lot of the opposition to Trump is based with a kind of system two logic. You know, he's we, we have to oppose his his policies or pronouncements based on facts and science and rationality and and his lack of adherence to rules. And it's not, um, we're not challenging him on the basis of system one. People are challenging him with a kind of system two logic. So what does that mean to you? Well, I think for a lot of people, system one is what, I think so much of us are driven by system one. It's important. It's key for us making good decisions. They work together. But, you know, I think this may be slightly outside of the dual processing, but just the journal, and Jason, you know this better than me, there's a, it's not easy to talk about values in technocratic spaces. It's not easy to talk about morality in technocratic spaces. 
And what I, so many of us just want to say is like, it's wrong to put kids in cages. There shouldn't have to be rules for that. It's just wrong. It's wrong to, you know, it's wrong to expose people to hazards. It's wrong to call, to say your opponent should go in jail. But it, we get caught up in trying to appeal, we get caught up in trying to, you know, operate in this system, this technocratic system. And like, for so many voters, clearly that does not matter. I think Jean Goodwin had a follow-up to Jason's question, so I I'm unmuted her. Jean, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for a great talk, Louis. It's, I, I wish we had even more time for discussion, because that's what we need to do in response to your provocation. Um, so I, um, I want to ask Jason's question in a slightly different way. Um, uh, you know, as a student of public discourse, it's really noticeable that uh, that moral claims are hard to make. It's hard to talk about morality in public. Uh, that one of the one of the signs of that is we're always talking about the effects of decisions on our kids. We can talk about mm. kids being affected, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, but we can't talk about how it affects our moral climate as adults because every adult has just gets to make their own moral decisions. Um, okay, so I gotta tell you though, that one of the, in public discourse, one of the things that drives out moral claims is scientism, um, is that science is the respected, universally respected basis for decisions. That's why that science denialism is totally miscalled because it's usually making up science to support people's positions. It, it indicates a deep reverence for and devotion to the idea of scientific decision-making, right? Um, so to me, um, aren't you afraid of demoting science? <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, Gene, what you said was like, I mean, you put in better words than I could. And that's what I'm getting at where I'm saying, am I an agent of oppression? And me operating as science, am I supporting this status quo where it's impossible for other people to bring up these claims of morality because I'm coming in with the science and I claim supremacy in this space. And it's something I constantly wrestle with. Yeah, this is, that was a really good way of phrasing what I was trying to get at. I can't hear Jean. I, I'll unmute her again there. Okay, yeah, just, um, uh, so I used to work for legal aid on the south side of Chicago, and I noticed that all of my clients thought I was part of the system of oppression, and I finally realized they were right, even though I thought I was on their <laughs> side. Um, I think what you have to do, I mean, this is just like general advice from an old person. Um, yeah, we all are on the side of the system of oppression, but luckily we have multiple identities and you got to ask yourself what other things you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, okay, <laughs> thanks. No, thank you. All right, so I know we want to keep the discussion going. I've sent a message. If anyone wants to ask their question instead of having me read it out, please just um, send a message or raise your hand so we can continue the discussion. If not, the next person that's on here is there's a question from Scott Shore. Louie, would you like me to read it out to you? Yeah, I, I'm lost in the chat. Sure. <laughs> there's a lot, there are a lot of questions here and a lot of comments. So I'll, Scott Shore says, what kind of society or organization does or could incorporate system one type thinking and decision making and resolve disparities between individuals or groups that differ in their system one processes, feelings, conclusions, desires? I think, you know, of course I don't have the answers. I'm just gonna think about the questions and point out the flaws I see. But I think a place where we can have open discussion around values and around these more subjective issues. And like, you know, I keep going back to the work of people like Jason and Katie, where they work really hard to create spaces where you can have these type of discussion. But it's like pulling teeth. We don't have, I think we need to provide spaces to discuss these type of issues. And I'm not sure if I can think of any large systems that do this well, you know, and my first inclination was to say like maybe some religious spaces, but even there, it can be difficult to talk about these issues. But I'm, you know, I'm, I would be glad to hear from other people who have my, you know, maybe ideas where this is happening.
All right. We have a question from Todd Quicken. Yeah. Hi, Louie. This is uh this is Todd Quicken. I'm but I'm represented at the GES Center with all of my authority, I guess. Um, <laughs> thank you for the the talk. Um, you <laughs> you've triggered all of these, I think, suppressed emotions that I've had. Um, and they stem from, so I'm trained probably exactly like you were in the environmental sciences, um, but I've also worked um, in the environmental NGO community as well. And part of the issue that I struggle with is even when I was at National Wildlife Federation, like I feel like the scientists that were there, that part of our job was to actually like combat that system one thinking in a way, right? Because I think traditionally like NGOs, like we we shoot for these very sort of ideal worlds that almost are never attainable. And then we have to sort of, you know, reframe those within the systems that you were talking about, typically sort of in science, but more I would say through economics. And I saw this in my own work in the mercury world where it was pretty obvious, right? And like you would say like, it's just the right idea to not spew mercury out of coal-fired power plant stacks, right? Like there shouldn't really be a discussion on that. But what I had to do, even using that science of the data that we were collecting and showing in real, like real terms, I had to basically point to hold up dead white babies to get the policy to be changed, right? Or point to a specific economic value of you know, trying to link it to how many fewer children will have learning disabilities and put a dollar value on that mm. beyond just being able to say, hey, can we stop spewing mercury out of out of power plant stacks? Like that seems like a pretty sort of easy thing to do. So I'm curious your thoughts on like, how do we actually sort of like bridge that gap? Because I feel like a lot of us in the environmental science world actually live in between those two systems, like system one and system two. And that we're like, we're conflicted in knowing like, okay, I know what I have to do to work within that system to even just get an incremental change. When actually though, I probably want to be more on the system one side of things. So I'm curious on like, how do we like move forward knowing that? And do we work within the system? Like I think we've been doing, which then equates to what you're saying, like we're actually part of the oppression problem. Or do we just, or do we not work within it? and somehow try to figure out how to still get to those, you know, ideals that I think we want to get to. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be glad for anyone else to contribute also, but I think, you know, what Jane said is right. We do have multiple hats. So like maybe by day you do this science stuff and your free time you do more advocacy. But I think also I'd much rather have a scientist in an organization or at the EPA that struggles with these questions than someone who doesn't. And the thing is that like was was interesting about you said is that like that's a subjective call to emphasize the the danger that mercury or pollution provides to a community. That's subjective. That's not straight science. You could just present something. You don't have to frame it that way. I think we need to and I'm thinking specifically our students, we need to highlight the subjectivity in the work they do and have them clearly think through that. Because I think if we just focus on that objectivity, it avoids them really thinking about these deep, more subjective questions. So I don't think that's the answer, but you know, yeah, I'm just as caught as you in these crosshairs, obviously. Okay, Louis, I'm actually getting a few people asking me to read you out loud uh, Rebecca Ward's question. And it says, I'm a doctoral student in science education and I've learned about bracketing and reflexivity in my research methods courses. Coming from a physical sciences background, this was novel for me. For example, you mean we're not objective? Uh, in thinking about the points you raised, do you think we should bring ourselves into our research more? The training I'm receiving suggests we should strive to disconnect ourselves from our work. I completely disagree with that. And, you know, the, <laughs> there's differences. I'm sure there are other people who completely disagree with what I just said, probably on this call. But um, I think it's incredibly dangerous to assume that your work is outside of you. Because at the end of the day, you drive your work. I'm not saying your work defines who you are, but you do drive that work. 
And you need to know why you're doing the work. Especially if you're, uh, you're teaching people, you're working at an agency around pollution. Why are you doing this work? These are questions that we need to explicitly think about. You're just not running a set of chemical tests. There's an end goal in what you're doing. So I, what I would tell my students is that your work doesn't define you, but you need to know how you define your work. And that involves asking these really subjective questions that we've had, that we don't provide. In our, in our science education, we don't do a good job of providing spaces to talk about that. So that's, you know, that's on us as professors and faculty. But you no, know, do not, I, I, I think it's unhealthy to um, distance yourself from your work like that. All right, and I'll just remind people we're happy to continue discussion. So if you raise your hand or if you wanna, you wanna continue the discussion on, on what we're talking about or each question, uh, please let me know. I see Rebecca said, thank you. Uh, we also have another question from, our, from a student, Jabin Ahmad. Mm -hmm. Let me just see if I can find it because I keep scrolling around. There's a there's a lot on here for you. Hold on. <laughs> Jabin, okay, so Jabin's question is, you mentioned recognizing and admitting failure, which I think is actually a pretty courageous and important thing to do. There's There's so much you can learn from failure and failure doesn't necessarily mean someone or something is bad or good. It may simply mean that it doesn't fit a specific set of circumstances or that we didn't know enough or we learned something new. But when people admit failure, it seems to result in undermining their credibility. It also seems to suggest that we completely toss aside an idea or remove ourselves from it instead of trying to improve it, though sometimes it isn't worth trying to fix. I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this, but how do we allow it so that recognizing or admitting failure is acceptable? Yeah, I think, and this is like a system one answer completely, but I think there's just not enough empathy and space for empathy in our scientific pursuits. I think we all play lip service to the idea that science is about failure and learning for your failures, but he's completely right. We don't provide space for that. And um, this is slightly adjacent, but something I constantly think about that's related to this is, um, and I hope it makes sense to people. We often call people racist, you know? And the thing is, people aren't racist. They do racist things. But being called racist is a death knell. You know, so people are, people are so afraid of being called racist that they will deny they're doing racist actions. So, like, you know, you're not racist, but you did something racist. And let's learn from that and become better. I think there's, in our society, there's just not much space to provide for people to learn from the mistakes they make. And then, you know, strictly from an academic standpoint, there's not much to be real with the students. You can't afford to fail that much if you're at an R1 university and you're an assistant professor, especially if you want tenure. If you want to stick around, you have to kind of play the game and <laughs> maybe you can start talking about failures after you have tenure. But you're right, it's dangerous to do that beforehand, unless you're a rock star and you're on a book circuit or something. Thank you. I have another question here from Caitlin Riley. A lot of environmental or scientific messaging is based on system two. We want to give people scientific facts and assume that they'll change their mind about issues once they have more information, but we know that doesn't really work in most class cases. I'm curious, what do you see as the implications for science communication, especially around issues like climate change, or the shift in approaching system one versus system two that you're talking about? Um, yeah, thanks, Caitlin. I think that goes back to like, if I, and it goes back to the comment that Todd said, if I tell you that contributing to climate change or these pollution, we don't want to contribute emissions that will increase the climate change, or we don't want to do things that will perpetuate our current you know, track that we're on because it's morally wrong, people will say I'm being political. You know, again, I think a lot of these subjective assertions about, you know, we protect the earth because that's the right thing. There's just not space for doing that. And the minute you do that, someone accuses you of being political 
are like, you know, you're a scientist, you need to stick to the facts. But I, I don't think facts move. I know they don't. You're right, Caitlin. The research shows that like um, deficit, mo deficit models of communication don't work. They can actually turn people off. All right, I have a question from uh, Jamie. Caitlin says, thank you. A question from Jamie. This was very validating for me as someone who is in academia. I always thought I was at a disadvantage in academia because I'm emotional. I actually have the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And I was going to read the book, hoping to completely switch over to system one so that I can be more productive as a researcher and as a contributor to science. Now I'll read it to see how we can develop a healthy balance between the two systems in research and in our communication with stakeholders. Maybe this is more of a, a comment for you. I don't know if you wanna say anything about that. And please also students, if you prefer to ask your questions so people don't have to keep hearing me and Louie can get to know who you are, that'd be great too. I'd be happy to unmute you. Yeah, I think that's great. And also Kahneman's a great, I mean, they won the Nobel prize for their work. so. Any chance you can get to read Kahneman and Tversky is great. And they have amazing insights into like, you know, how decision making works. But yeah, you're right. We do act like system two thinking is the only thing that we value. But people are constantly, if you're in academia long enough, you realize that id and ego are constantly running rampant. We just hide it with other stuff. Okay, and I see I'm going to, Unmute Ruben Rajan. I think he has a question. Hey, Louis. Uh, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, man. This was uh, pretty good. Um, I have a, a general question. How universal do you think is the classification of uh, thinking into system one and, 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 and system two? Uh, because I, I suspect that it depends a lot on, 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 on cultures. Just to give a, a, an, an example, uh, you mentioned before, and I think we would all agree here, that uh, it's bad to put uh, kids in cages. <laughs> but uh, is it bad to let a baby cry to teach the baby how to sleep? Lord, I'm pretty man. sure that there will be different opinions here. <laughs> I mean, speaking as a parent, whose kids often cry themselves to sleep. Clearly, I don't think that's bad. Yeah, and there I would disagree. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so, yeah, but, but coming back to, to the original question, to, to what extent do you think that this classification uh, between uh, system one thinking and, and, system, two, uh, and system two thinking is, is universal? And I don't think it's universal. I mean, it clearly grows out of Western science. It's like, you know, I was trained in Western science and those are the biases I was brought up with. So I think, I think so many times we assume, especially in my field of cognitive psychology, we assume that our work is normative for everybody. But, you know, I agree with, I don't think it's normative. I think a lot of it is incredibly culturally subjective and we just have not, had we haven't had we haven't talked to the right people or haven't we haven't been sophisticated enough in our experiments on our work to really show how this difference across people and across different you know societies and there's just this huge western bias in how we think about stuff it's like you know system one system two, two type thinking that may not be the right paradigm for everybody Louis, I have a question from Sebastian Sarate. Sorry, Ruben, did you want to make another comment? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Sebastian says, what would it take to deconstruct our own biases and increase these types of reflections in wider academic practitioner circles that may end up benefiting from that system of oppression of oppressions we criticize? I'm not sure, but I think it's important that we have spaces where we can talk about this. You know, and I keep saying this importance of space for talking, but I think even in my own personal, oh, this is so corny, journey, you know, I've really, I, 
you know, I've told Jason he's a good colleague, and I've told Katie they're good colleagues, but really they have helped me think about these issues I've had in the back of my hand, mind with a much more subjective framework. You know, working with them and really, you know, a field that I was not trained in has really helped me examine my own biases and how I do my work and really help, you know, really deconstruct my place in science. So hopefully, you know, you're lucky enough to encounter colleagues who kind of know this literature that can help you work through it. I think maybe we should start thinking differently about how we train our PhD students. Like, can we provide spaces for them? Can we have a class where, where we just do this? You know, you come to this class and like, let's deconstruct your place in science. All right, Todd has a follow-up to this. Hold on one second. Go ahead, yeah, so, Todd. So, so Sebastian, it, it triggered something. And so, so I do a lot of work inside the Convention on Biological Diversity. And it's interesting because in that space, we're actually allowed to have these kinds of conversations, um, which is, is interesting because you have sort of this push and pull from, you know, I would say the system one and system two, where you've got, you know, hardcore scientific data sometimes butting up against some of these um, more sort of ethical, moral conversations. But while I think, while that's great, and I love being a part of those, I think at the same time, those conversations and deliberations take forever and almost never does a decision gets made. So I'm curious your thoughts on like enabling these kinds of conversations in the face sometimes of particularly environmental issues and decisions that are really urgent. And I know that like we put ourselves in the situation where we're now faced with these urgent decisions probably because we hadn't had those conversations that we want to have but how do we how do we deal with that in some instances in this world where we want to have these conversations which which then take a long time at least in the UN it does <laughs> we're faced with sometimes of these really urgent decisions that really almost pushes us even further into that system two kind of decision making thinking yeah I think that's a um that's a really good observation and you know, I don't have answers. I mean, my inclination is that even though it's late in the day, if we don't have these conversations, we're gonna answer. I think we I think that we will find a way to mitigate a lot of climate change. You know, that's the faith I have in society. But I think we're gonna do if we don't have conversations about these more subjective issues, we will do it in such a way that continues to oppress the same groups of people. I think, you know, these conversations are hard. They often feel like we're going in circles. They're uncertain. But I think if we don't have them, we will create solutions that perpetuate the sad state of affairs that we currently find ourselves in. And I think we have to be willing to burn it all down. <laughs> you know, I think at some point we need people in power who are saying like, you know what, I'm gonna totally reconfigure the way this institution works to prioritize this type of thinking. And that's a risk, because maybe it turns out that's wrong. Louie, I'm gonna un unmute Andrew Hardwick. He had a, a question, uh, a comment for you. Mm -hmm. Sure thing, yeah. I w hi, Louie, I was kind of inspired, I guess, by what um, Todd was talking about earlier about Mercury and all and what we've been talking about just now. Um, the idea that there's multiple different groups that we're serving, like the factory owners, they wouldn't, care to actually clean up that mercury, they would rather not do it, you know, because it benefits them more. And so I guess that makes me think about talking about all these needs for collaboration. Oh, maybe sometimes we don't need to have collaboration because certain people aren't going to budge no matter what. And we just need to say, like you were talking about, the people in power just need to go and do something. They don't throw, in a sense, I guess, throw some values out the door because we, for whatever reason, we don't care to listen to them because we know we're not going to really like resolve whatever issue we're trying to resolve. So I guess, um, question I guess I want to pose to you that as maybe a follow-up to that is deciding on when is it worthwhile like for environmental justice to ignore the views of like the factory owner or something and instead care more about like those minority people that we want to be helping? Yeah, that's a great question. 
and uh, comment. And it's something I struggle with, you know, and again, I think it's something we struggle, struggle with on the GE tree is like, to what extent do you prioritize voices that already have power? And I think the thing is that we can't ignore them because they do have power. And going back to kind of an empathetic answer, I don't think that these people want to be doing these horrible things. I don't think anybody wakes up and says, I want to pollute my local environment with mercury. We need to provide pathways for people to do better, even if they are a factory owner. I, I just don't, there's no way that we get to solutions if we don't include all stakeholders, even the stakeholders that we think are conventionally doing the wrong thing. And you know what I focus on is that like the system is wrong, not the people. And like, can we help provide pathways for people to do the right thing? Louis, I think that we're out of time, but I want to thank you for your presentation. I'm saving the chat because there were a number of other comments and questions that are on there. I think you probably, you might want to uh, take a look at. And thank mm -hmm. you, everyone. I hope that we all will go on our journey and think about our role as scientists and the impact of our research into communities as well. So thank you very much for your thought-provoking presentation today. Yeah, thank you guys for patience for some ramblings in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I appreciate the feedback and the discussion.